Hey guys, uh, welcome to wow, episode 61, can you believe it, of probably around about 80 episodes in total, probably about 20 to go from here. Um, good to see you guys. Uh, thanks for being here. It's uh, another very cold night. It's 11 o'clock, seven minutes past 11 uh, here in South Africa. Uh, it's pretty cold. Um, the picture you see uh, to the um, right of me, or that's the left, the way I'm looking at it, um, is actually, well, let, let me ask you, what, what do you think you're looking at in that picture? Loris, Iceland, good to see you. Um, what, do you guys, what do you guys think is in this picture to my, well, to my left, but to your right, I guess? What do you think you're looking at? Uh, Zircon says it's 104 degrees Fahrenheit in Arizona. That's pretty pretty warm. It's below, well, it'll probably go below freezing here tonight. Any ideas? So what we're going to deal with in this episode is actually for the first time where Paul Gauguin basically says, okay, I accept the deal. I'm kind of it's like I'm on my way kind of thing. Um, um, you've offered me a deal. I accept the deal. And now uh, here I come kind of thing. Um, I sense his seasons changing. Sharon says Idaho near the water tower. No. So this is actually a photo taken uh, right outside um, the office that I'm sitting in right now. Um, basically with the camera pointing upward. And um, what you see on the right hand side is the silhouette of the peach tree that was planted close to the side of the, of the, close to the wall, right, in the shade. And it's obviously been in the shade all winter. The, the incredible thing is the peach tree on the right is now not only bigger than the peach tree on the left, but it's maintained its leaves through the whole winter so far. And the other thing that's quite incredible, I don't know if you can actually see it in this picture, but the leaves aren't even yellow. They're sort of yellowish, but the, the leaves are actually still kind of green. So what you have is two trees right next to one another. The one has decided to keep some of its leaves. Obviously, it's lost quite a few but to keep some of its leaves, and the other one has thrown off all of its leaves. Let's see if I can show you another picture. So there you kind of get a better idea. This tree on the left is about a foot shorter than the tree on the right. It's also a peach tree, and doesn't have a single leaf on it, which is right because it's winter, whereas the peach tree on the right has kept, as you can see, quite a few of its leaves. Or, or, or uh, most of the leaves are sort of yellowing, uh, but but some of them are actually still mostly green. I don't know if you guys can see that. And so, don't you find it quite extraordinary how trees, the same kind of tree, can have its own preferences, its own attitude, its own um, what's the word? Its own um, way of doing things, essentially. So here's a third picture. Now, what you're seeing there isn't, what you're seeing over there isn't leaves of this tree. It's leaves of the tree on the right, just seen from that angle. Quite, quite amazing, isn't it? I thought I would just share that with you. Okay. So we're going to now move over to this letter. Um, it's, well, we're going to, that's the letter we ended off on in the previous episode, a uh, letter from Vincent to Theo, uh, dated the 17th of September. You may remember that he wrote three letters on that one day. The pertinent part is that he, he um, quoted Gauguin saying, basically, you're going to have to pay my traveling expenses and my debts if you want me to come. So you can see he's already quite a demanding dude, right? Um, which is a nice way of saying is a jerk and an arsehole. But there you have it. Uh, you're going to have to pay my traveling expenses and my debts if you want me to come, 
because I don't have any money. That's that's kind of his position. You can also kind of get the sense that the Van Gogh option was like the last option. He, he was sort of their last resort. Uh, he, uh, they were they were essentially his last resort. And now he's reached a point uh, with three months to go in the year. Well, you know what? I think I'm going to do this. Uh, just show me the money, and 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 I'll um, I'll I'll kind of do my thing, right? Uh, thanks a lot, Snow Lion. Mel still says I don't have earbuds, and my next door neighbor is mowing his lawn. Talk about noise. Okay, well, it's a totally different situation here. It's late at night, quiet. Okay, so let's start with. The, the second of the three letters on the 17th of September. And bear in mind, we, we're we going to get to a letter that Gauguin writes that, that still remains. And we're going to see what is said in that letter. I think it's three or four letters from this point. And then we're going to kind of get another sense of uh, Gauguin in his own words, right? Right? So... Yeah, I, I, um, I think that's a reasonable thing to say. So anyway, um, Vincent writes, My dear Theo, I wrote to you already early this morning. Then I went away to go with a picture of a garden in the sunshine. Then I brought it back and went out again with a blank canvas. And that also is finished. And now I want to write you again. Because I've never had such a chance, nature here being so extraordinarily beautiful. Right? So again, what I want you to focus on and look out for is what is his state of mind what you want to do is monitor his state of mind constantly we don't want to basically say wow um he's he's um he seems to be going crazy we kind of want to each letter basically say what are we dealing with here how what is his state of mind like so that when we see something in the letter where we go, wow, he's totally losing it, we can say, well, you know, this didn't catch us by surprise. We can see, we can see at the moment where he started going nuts, if that's, if that's how you want to put it, right? So we do purposely want to keep asking this question, how is he doing? And so... Early on, this, early on in this letter from the 17th, he, he says, it's so beautiful here. Do you think he would be making a statement like that? Do you think you talk about how beautiful the weather is or the trees or whatever if you in a very dark place in your heart, in your mind? Are you able to make those sort of um, observations? Are you able to get that sort of distance where you go, wow, I really appreciate how wonderful life is. Are you able to do that when you're in a dark place? And what's quite an interesting um, thing to note about that is if you are in a dark place, one of the ways to get out of it is by expressing gratitude, even if you don't feel grateful, trying to express gratitude, trying to notice things outside of yourself, trying to simply be in the moment, not trapped in the past or whatever it is, right? So, uh, and we are kind of going to be dealing with that subject matter, um, darkness, on True Crime Rocket Science when we deal with the Nicola Bully case. I've actually put up a post on Patreon. So that is something that we need to kind of be thinking about. Okay, so let's, let's continue. So he says, um, everywhere and all over the vault of heaven is a marvelous blue and the Sun sheds a radiance of pale sulfur, and it is soft and as lovely as the combination of heavenly blues and yellows in a thunder of Delft. I think we've actually done this letter. I think we have actually dealt with it. But anyway, the point is he is really loving where he is. He's loving the colors. He's loving the landscape, right? It is easier said than done. It is easier said than done. Okay, so I think let's just jump over to the next letter. Remember, he um, was starting to decorate his home, and he, he speaks about um, the portrait of Eugene Bach, and he did a self-portrait, and he did that, 
and in in in, in the um, what's what's the word in um, relevant to to that this idea of him decorating his home with his own art i found this article it came out really recently um 23rd of june 2023 that's literally two days ago it's an article what paintings did van gogh hang above his bed that kind of makes me wonder did the guy who wrote is the guy who wrote did the guy who wrote this article does he follow van gogh letters because it's right where we are in van gogh letters uh, this article right and so um there there van gogh has actually painted his room and what does he do he actually paints his room with the pictures hanging in his room and and that gives us an idea of what is where and so if you um let's do this if you zoom in what do you think that picture is over there what do you think that so he's painted a picture of a painting that he's already painted, right? And so when you look at that picture, what do you think that is? And then there's another picture beside it. What do you think that is? Do you agree that these are both portraits? Just looking at this picture zoomed in, do you agree that those are both portraits of those are faces there's a face and there's a face do you agree with that and so if you look at this picture and you see it basically looks like it's kind of got a yellow foreground and and then it's got kind of a blue background right right and then if you go to this it's either this picture and personally i think it is this picture or it is the self-portrait, which is kind of a greener picture, right? So when we go to this, I think that is the portrait of the poet, the Belgian poet Eugene Bach. And I think that is some other picture. His self-portrait, I don't actually know where it is. It's not, it's not really here. It's not in this, in this execution. Right, uh, Lynn Lippy says the other is the postman. Well, that's that's not a bad guess, but it's not not true. It's not it's not the postman. So there's a close up of those two portraits. The second one is of a um, portrait of Paul Eugène Melier, and there's a very interesting story surrounding this this dude, right? Paul Eugene uh, Melier, right? So um, let's go through this article. I'll put a link in. Um, in chat, if you want to check it out on your own time. Um, so he says, what did Van Gogh? So, so what did Van Gogh chose to I think that should be choose, right? What did Van Gogh choose to display in his room in the yellow house? And uh, so he says here, he completed both portraits a month before depicting them in the bedroom. Well, so it's the, it's the picture, the painting called the bedroom. And what is really interesting is he then talks about, um, he talks about these people. So first of all, he mentions Bach. He describes him as the poet, who's a Belgian artist who is also working in all. And this is the part that's so fascinating. His sister, Anna, became the only person that we know of to have bought an identified Van Gogh painting during his lifetime. Now it suddenly becomes far more personal. I mean, at this point, Anna hadn't bought that the, the red vineyard, right? And so the fact that Van Gogh has put Bach's uh, portrait above his bed clearly shows that um, some relationship has formed, some friendship has developed, some feeling of, of um, enjoying one another's company, trusting one another, feeling some sort of kinship. And then that gets further reinforced by his sister buying 
um, his red vineyard, which must have been a huge boost in his confidence, right? And you would also imagine that Eugene Bach told told people around him, wow, you guys need to meet Van Gogh. I've never met anyone like this. You guys, uh, by the way, there's this artist in all his, um, like nobody I've ever met. Uh, his art is really interesting. I think he's going to be, be a big deal one day. So it seems like maybe there is one person close at hand besides his brother that seemed to believe in him, that, that, that seemed to see him for who he was, that seemed to recognize something special was happening, right? And so isn't that extraordinary? I mean, if you think about it, you might say, yeah, so what? Somebody bought his art. Well, in a scenario where you've painted like hell um, and nobody's bought your art, the one person who does buy your art, you're going to feel such a sense of relief and gratitude towards, aren't you? And and this isn't even that person. This is his sister. It's quite incredible. Okay. Then he says, Melier, this is now a reference to the soldier. He says, Melier, who served in the Zouave regiment, was characterized by Van Gogh as the lover because of the soldier's reputed success with young women. So can you see there's kind of, um, I don't want to say two, a double-edged sword, but it's kind of a, these two pictures on his wall in a weird way represent two sides to Van Gogh. The one side of Van Gogh is sort of Van Gogh the artist, Van Gogh the poet, if you will, Van Gogh the writer, Van Gogh the person who is trying to become, I don't want to say a successful artist because I don't think he is trying to become successful. He's just trying to survive, really. He's trying to just improve as an artist, but he's trying to become someone from the perspective of someone who's not um, something, you know, in, in the sense that society hasn't really accepted him. Society don't really understand him. Society don't really get what he's doing in terms of his art. And so that's a process that's underway. But there's, there's, there's someone in his orbit, a poet, that seems to see something, something lyrical, something special, something colorful, something poetic, if you will, in his art. And, and guess what? He's right. He, he, you might say that he was one of the first people, perhaps besides Theo, to recognize Van Gogh's great potential as someone who might redefine art in some way or, or someone whose who's psychology and philosophy in terms of the way he was seeing the world was quite special, quite significant, quite revolutionary even, right? So that's the one side. The other side is a soldier who is a, kind of a, what's the word, a ladies' man. That's the other side of Van Gogh. That's Van Gogh. Van Gogh appreciates this guy's life, his virility, his sexuality, his um, masculinity, his spirit. You know the fact that um, he is, um, I guess, in a way, living his best life, particularly in one particular area, and that is the side to Van Gogh that is not very well appreciated. So you can you can um, talk to anyone about Van Gogh and everyone will say the same thing. He was a troubled artist. He cut off his ear. He, um, uh, he, he, he was mad and he, and he took his own life, right? That's kind of the conventional story. And then, but the whole story is really about art. The, the whole story is Van Gogh um, was this obsessive artist. He he felt things really intensely. Then you say, yeah, okay, but, and? No, 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 well, he, you know, he painted sunflowers and he, and he, and he painted the cypresses and he painted Starry Night. Yes, what, what else? Well, no, and, and he kind of went crazy, he went to an asylum. Yes, con what else? T tell me more. He cut off his ear. Yes. Tell me more about Van Gogh, the man. Uh, he uh, he was very lonely. Yes, keep going. 
What part are we missing? Yeah, so you, you're right about that. What part are we missing in this narrative? Uh, B, good to have you here. What what part are we missing in the narrative? What, what What's highlighted on your screen right now? What, what, what part of this man is the story that you never hear about? I mean, you hear about it in the first half of his life. You hear that he um, had inappropriate feelings towards his cousin and that he wanted to uh, marry a prostitute who was pregnant and that he had feelings for the neighbor. You hear about that in the first half of the story. But in the second half, suddenly he's kind of become a monk. Did he become a monk? Did he really lose those feelings of sexuality? Did, did he like turn a new leaf and suddenly he is just a fully committed artist? Right? We, we're missing the, the, the fact that he is a, a man. He likes women. He wishes that he had a girlfriend. Right? He is um, someone who is 35 years old and, and for pretty much his whole life, he's never really had a proper relationship. He's had quite a few improper relationships and they've all like crashed and burned, right? And you might look at Van Gogh and say, mm, you know what, maybe he wasn't really interested. You know what, he, he was really interested in his art. He wasn't interested in women. Well, maybe not. When you read his letters, you can see that he talks um, passionately about certain characters that had certain uh, dalliances. Sometimes it's a female character, but, but the books that he's reading are quite um, salacious. And, um, you know, the fact that he's reading them like 130 years ago is actually quite astonishing for the... Um, just, just the sort of sexual adventures that are going on in them, right? And so it's actually not not a surprise, knowing what he reads about, that he that he kind of euro worships this guy, um, Millier, right? And this is where also Gauguin comes in. Gauguin is kind of a combination of Bach, in the sense that he's an artist but not in the sense that I'm sure Bach is a gentleman and a, a good guy, whereas Gauguin is a jerk. But, but Gauguin is kind of a combination of Bach and Melier in the sense that he's a poet, or a, and you'll see when we read his letter that, that he is quite poetic in how he expresses himself in an arsehole way. And then he's also um, very, very passionate about women and about sex, I guess. And so, in a way, Gauguin personifies these two sides of Van Gogh, the artist and the lover. And Van Gogh is kind of a failure at both. And so, sometimes maybe he feels like, wow, I've had enough of art. I think I'm going to try love. Okay, I've had enough of love. I'm going to go back to art. Well, Gauguin seems to kind of straddle, <laughs> excuse the pun, uh, both worlds, right? And what do you think happens when Gauguin arrives in all? And so this is giving us an insight into the real Van Gogh. Van Gogh may present himself in certain ways and the Van Gogh Museum may present himself in certain ways, but putting these two portraits above his bed basically tell us what and who means something to him. He admires Bach, this poetic, artistic fellow. And then he admires someone who's the antithesis of an artist, which is a soldier, someone who probably doesn't have a creative bone in his body, but is nevertheless um, has tremendous success with the ladies, and he admires that, right? Are you, um, are you, are you, are you with me? Are you on the same wavelength? Do, do you think that this is true, or do you think, no, 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 I think, I don't think it's, I don't think it's um, magical. Mother says uh, he's a feeling human, not just an artist. Okay, right. So let's let's um, bring it back. So 
So uh, Millier served in that Zouave regiment. He was characterized by Van Gogh as the lover because of the soldier's reputed success with young women. On the 2nd of October, 1888, so that's going to about two weeks from now, right? Van Gogh wrote to Bach to say that the portrait of him and Millet are in my bedroom. So it's not just that we've found this, it's almost like a photo of um, Brian Laundrie's bedroom, right? It's not that we've just got this picture of his of Van Gogh's bedroom. It's we've got a picture of his bedroom at this really important time. The picture of his bedroom is telling us a lot about who he who he really is at this time. The other thing that's worth mentioning is there are two other pictures below those portraits, right? And they are sketchy impressions of two frameworks, possibly Japanese prints. Above the wash basin is a mirror, which he used for making self-portraits. There's the mirror over there. Right, and then um, he did another one. So he did two pictures of his bedroom, that one, and then this one, and this one's slightly different. Now there's a woman over here. This woman has now replaced the lover. Hold on, um, I'm a little bit confused now. Is that is that three different ones? If you look, there's two portraits. There's the soldier over there, and that's October 1888. Then you look at this one. There's a woman over there and a man over there, and that man might be Van Gogh himself. And then that's I think definitely Van Gogh. Actually, I don't know who that is, but now there's a woman over there. And th this one is September 1889. So, so um, this one was painted a year later. And this one was painted also a year later. Quite interesting. So one wonders why he changed these, these portraits, like in his memory. So here it says, nearly a year late, he painted copies of the bedroom to send to his mother, Anna, and younger sister, Bill. So the fact that he's going to send these paintings to his mother, well, now, now does he have to explain why he's got a, a picture of the lover, the, the soldier? And instead of having the lover on his wall, he puts, I guess, his sister on his wall. He says, by this time, he had left the yellow house and moved to the asylum. Interestingly, he changed the two portraits, presumably to please his mother and sister. This also tells you something about Van Gogh, like, how can I put it? Uh, Van Gogh isn't completely what you see is what you get, right? Do you know what I'm saying? There's something of an underlying psychology to Van Gogh that's quite subtle. If you blink, you'll miss it. And so a very good example of that is Yeri paints three versions of this bedroom. And if you're not looking carefully, you won't notice that those portraits are different because everything else is pretty much the same. That's the same, that's the same, that's the same, but that's different. That's the same, that's the same, but that's different, right? Interesting, right? Boch was replaced by a self-portrait, one showing him unusually without a beard. He also sent this portrait to his mother and Will. The other portrait replacing Millier is of a woman and does not correspond to any known paintings by Vincent. And so they said maybe that is uh, his sister. And then it refers to those other pictures. I just thought that this was quite an interesting segue into what we're talking about right now. Uh, other news, uh, some of these pictures are coming up for auction in London. That one and that one. Okay, are you re guys ready to get back to the letter? Karina, good to see you. Good to see you here. Um, okay, so now let's go to that last letter. 
So this is the third letter he wrote on the 17th of September. Dear Theo, many thanks for your letter and the 50 franc note which it contained. I also received Morin's drawing, which is magnificent. That man is a great artist. Last night I slept in the house. And though there are some things still to be done, I feel very happy in it. So again, we are at the 17th of September. And how is Van Gogh doing? How, how does Van Gogh represent his own, how does he diagnose his own mental state? Well, he says, I feel very happy. Right? Do you think he's depressed? Do you think he's sick? Do you think he's despairing? Do you think he's worrying that his art's not selling? Do you think he's really feeling burdened by how much he keeps asking his brother for money? Do you think any of those things are an issue for him? Or is he in a really good place on the 17th of September? I agree. It sounds like quite a good attitude. So he says, besides, I feel that I can make something lasting out of it from which others can profit as well. Now money spent will not be money lost. And I think that you will soon see the difference. At present, it reminds me of Bosworm's interiors with the red tiles, the white walls, the furniture of white deal and walnut and the glimpses of an intensely blue sky and greenery through the windows. Um, I can... I can actually see that in my mind's eye when he um, when he describes that because I was right there. I was in all. I stood kind of on a green lawn under oak trees, right beside the River Rhone, right in front of where the yellow house used to be, and I sort of looked up. I heard the trees whispering, and I can imagine that intensely blue sky and the greenery through the windows that was there when I was there. Then he says. Its surroundings, the public garden and night cafes and the grocers are not Millet, but instead are Dumier, absolute Zola. So in a weird way, bear in mind, do you remember that book that he, that he um, inserted into that portrait that was sort of an, an allegory for his father, the big Bible and the little yellow book next to it? Remember that? Well, now in a way... Now, in a way, he's living in, in that picture, in, in a sense. Do you remember that? And there's the yellow book, and that's a book by Zola. But can you see it's a, it's a kind of a bright yellow volume, right? And that's by Emil Zola. There's, I think that's the title over there, right? And now he's actually living almost inside the cover of that book in, in terms of the walls of the house are painted yellow and inside the rooms are white walls, right? Like the, like the pages of a book. And there he says, absolute Zola. And that is the kind of life that he's still aspiring to. Is a sort of pilgrim's life where his life is in service to others, where he doesn't live an extravagant life, uh, but he quietly toils kind of in personal and private service to humanity. That's how he sees himself. That is the, the Zola psychology. And although he seemed to believe in that um, psychology, like I'm trying to think when it was, that his father died in 1885. Um, so this makes it three years ago, he was very into Zola and he still is. Then he says, and that is quite enough to supply one with ideas, isn't it? Yesterday, I had already written to you saying that if I figured the two beds at 300 francs, the price will not allow for any further reduction. If I have already bought more than that anyway, it is because I put half of last week's money into it. Yesterday, again, I had to pay 10 francs to the innkeeper and 50 francs for a mattress. By the way, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to have to bring this up, but uh, with Van Gogh talking about money, I think I must also talk about money. I've done 
quite a few Van Gogh letters and I think I've done four or five and I, and I think I've just noticed that that the total super chat has been like five dollars or something like that and um, so just a friendly reminder the super chats do work on um, on this channel it is monetized so the super chats do work um, and so if you feel your conscience or your whatever urging you to make a contribution you are more than welcome so i thought i would just throw that in there um he says at the moment i have five francs left so i must beg you uh to send me what you can or else but do let it be by return mail a louis to la to last me the week or indeed 50 francs if it's possible so can you see how um pretty much all of this letter is really about money. It goes up to here. All of this is about money. Now, I think it's one thing to want to live like Zola and be a pilgrim. It's another, if somebody else is footing the bill. So Yeri says, um, in one way or another, I'd like to be able to count on getting this month, meaning the whole month, another 100 instead of the 50 as I asked in yesterday's letter, if I myself save 50 francs during the month and add the other 50 to that, I should have spent altogether 400 francs on furniture. My dear Theo, here we are on the right road at last. Certainly it does not matter being without hearth or home and living in cafes like a traveler so long as one is young, but it was becoming unbearable to me. So there is a little a little um, hint or a little reminder that that he has been struggling, that he has been, um, what's the word? He has been frustrated by this sort of itinerant existence, and anyone would be, right? Um, he's lived in cafes and he's, he's sort of, you know, gone from, uh, what do they call it? Pillar to from is it pillar to post, yeah. From pillar to post. From pillar to post. <laughs> and he, he said that was becoming unbearable. And thanks a lot, Karina. Right? And he was saying, um, my plan is all complete. I will try to paint up to the value of what you send me every month. And after that, I want to paint to pay for the house. What I paint for the house will be to repay you for previous expenditure. Now, bear in mind, he's saying all of this when he hasn't really sold one painting. He's making quite a big promise. He's saying, don't worry, Theo, I'm going to pay you back for the furniture and for all the money you sent me by selling my art. Well, if you count how much his art is worth, after he died, I suppose he did, he did, um, what's the word, he did come good on his promise, but technically he didn't, if that makes sense. Uh, thanks a lot, Josie, I appreciate it. Um, even one dollar is a, is, a, is a gesture worth making, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, pull it to post. So then he says, um, so I think the point that is, important to emphasize here is that it was unbearable. Do, do you follow? Um, in other words, it's not unbearable right now. He was going through something that was hard, but he nevertheless endured it. And now we is now is in a happy place. He's got his own home. His home is the way he wants it, the way he likes it. And so he's in a happy place. He couldn't actually be in a better place um how can i put this if if um if you could go back in time and and warn van gogh and say listen here this year you're gonna go through the most traumatic episode yet in your entire life right it's gonna happen this year what's gonna happen um i can't tell you the details but what's gonna happen is you're going to almost bleed to death and so um, what we need to do is get you into a good place 
so that you that doesn't happen to you right I'm, what i'm trying to say is if you could go back in time and warn him you could hardly do better than put him in the position he is in right now where you say dude um well thanks a lot snow lion i appreciate it um you could hardly put him in a better place than say dude you you're quite vulnerable you're in quite a dangerous unsafe situation a dangerous position this fact that you keep moving around and you know what what we need to do is get you settled somewhere in your own place and and then and then you need to start you know in that settled secure safe environment but also kind of controlled environment that's where you're going to uh, be able to be an artist and and not worry about everything and and so that's exactly the position he's in on the 17th of september and so you kind of go what could go wrong what could go wrong and and i don't you see more and more clearly that the answer isn't van gogh going wrong it's not bad weather it's not that he can't sell his art it's not that his brother starts becoming uh, acting up towards him or something. It's it's nothing other than Gauguin coming to stay with him. It's nothing other than one particular person coming into his space and totally upsetting the apple cart. We don't exactly know how that happens or why that happens, but we know when it happens. And we're going to find out, I guess, how that happens. But can you see that he's in probably the best position he can be in? And then someone comes along and kind of ruins it. Can you see that? Thanks a lot, Robbie Robin. That's Those are my thoughts as well. Can you see that it's quite clear? It's not a mystery. But that, I mean, it's looking like it's, it's very clear. I mean, we, we've yet to go through that period. So um, let's go back to the letter. So he says, um, so my plan is all complete and I will try to paint up the value. And then he says, I'm still a bit commercial in the sense that I long to prove that I pay my debts and that I know how much I want for the goods, which this blasted poor painter's profession keeps me working at. Then he says, altogether, I think I can be almost sure of bringing it off a set of decorations which will be worth 10,000 francs in time. I don't know, it's, it's quite sweet, quite cute, quite funny to hear him say that because on the one hand, on the one hand, what he's saying is utterly ridiculous. Like he hasn't, at this point in time, he hasn't sold a single artwork. And he's talking about bringing off sales of, of 10,000 francs. So on, on the one hand, you kind of think, dude, what are you smoking? But on the other hand, well, you know, a few weeks ago, I was in Manhattan. And in one museum, you, you see a portrait of Van Gogh in a glass casing. And in another museum in Manhattan, you see Starry Night. And you see everyone gravitating with their cell phones like it's Taylor Swift in the building. And you can barely get to the front of the queue yourself before someone nudges you out the way right and so um it's just so crazy that on the one hand you read this and you can't help sort of scoffing on the other hand reality shows that that his his faith his um self-belief is self-validation was all valid was all um you know like to use the word in terms of the submersible um it's like certified you know it is something that was um proper and true right uh magical mother says i maybe should have joined the patreon first okay Okay, so he goes on to say, listen to me. If we set up a studio and refuge here for some comrade who's hard up, no one will ever be able to reproach either you or me with living and spending for ourselves alone. 
Now to establish such a studio requires a floating capital, and I've eaten that up during my unproductive years. But now that I'm beginning to produce something, I shall pay it back. So what he's actually saying here is, brother, believe me, I'm going to be productive now. I'm really going to, you, you are going to, you, you are about to see something really incredible. And was he exaggerating? Right? He's saying, I am beginning to produce something. I shall pay it back. That's how he's feeling. So again, do you think he's feeling overwhelmed? Do you think he's feeling um, unmotivated? Do you think he's feeling he doesn't really he's not he doesn't really have he's not inspired? Do you think he's feeling troubled? Do you think he's feeling um, that he's not good enough? Well, all of this suggests otherwise that he's up to it. He's up to the task to prove himself if for no one else to his brother, right? Okay. Then he says, I assure you that I think it is essential for you as well as me and no more than our right to, to always have a Louis or two in our pockets and some stock of goods to do business with. But my idea is that in the end, we shall have founded and left to posterity a studio where one successor could live. I do not know if I explained myself clearly enough, but in other words, we are working for an art and for a business method that will not only last our lifetime, but can still be carried on by others after us. So he's thinking about a legacy. For your part, you do this in your business, and it is certain that you will make good in the end. And even though you have plenty to harry you at the moment, but for my part, I foresee that other artists will want to see color under a stronger sun and in a more Japanese clarity of light. And he's right. That is what the world would want to see, is color under a stronger sun. That was um, Van Gogh's gift to the art world, in a nutshell. Now, if I set up a studio and refuge right at the gates of the South, it's not such a crazy scheme. And it means that we can work on serenely. And if other people say that it is too far from Paris, etc., let them. So much the worse for them. Why did the greatest colorist of all, Eugene Delacroix, think it essential to go South and ride to Africa? Obviously, because not only in Africa, but from all onward, you are bound to find beautiful contrasts of red and green, of blue and orange, of sulfur and lilac. And what do you think of the blue in, 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 in these colors? This is a uh, South African blue. There's no enhancing in, in, and this is the winter sky. The summer uh, blue is even bluer. So he says, all true colorists must come to this, must admit that there is another kind of color than that of the North. I am sure if Gauguin came, he would love this country. If, if he doesn't, it's because he has already experienced more brightly colored countries and he will always be a friend and one with us in principle. And someone else will come in his place. If what one is doing looks out upon the infinite, and if one sees that one's work has its raison d'etre, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, raison d'etre, and continuance in the future, that's reason for being, then one works with more serenity. Now you have a double right to that. You are kind to painters. And I tell you, the more I think it over, the more I feel that there's nothing more truly artistic than to love people. That's quite a, a, a thing to say. It's quite a thing to say. It's also quite interesting that Van Gogh doesn't paint his brother, his own brother, into one of those portraits. It definitely is quite interesting. You will say that 
then it would be a good thing to do without art and artists. That, that is true in the first instance, but then the Greeks and the French and the old Dutchmen accepted art, and we see our art always comes to life again after inevitable periods of decadence. Isn't that exactly what's about to happen? Isn't Van Gogh going to become a victim of his own decadence, uh, also a victim of Gauguin's decadence and the temptation to be decadent? Isn't that going to, and then, and then there's going to be kind of a resurrection. There's going to be almost a death of the artist, a huge setback, and then kind of a coming back to life again, a kind of a resurrection. You know what I'm saying? Let's have a look at this word decadence. Decadence. And according to Google, it means moral or cultural decline characterized by excessive indulgence in pleasure or luxury. Decadence. Decadence. And you could also just say debauchery, corruption, degeneracy, um, self-indulgence, right? Decadence. Well, what do you think is about to happen in this story? What, what do you think is going to happen when Gauguin comes onto the scene in all? What do you think is going to happen? And I think the best way to ask this question is to say, is Gauguin a decadent dude? Is Gauguin someone that you'd associate with decadence, what do you guys think? Do you think that he is a moral guy, like he's abandoned his family, that he's going to go and marry 14-year-old Tahitians, that he um, he's also excessively indulgent? So doesn't that mean he is decadent? Decadence. And what lies at the end of that decadence? Isn't it um, ruin? Sickness, death, bloodshed. There you go. It's starting to become quite clear, isn't it? He says, I do not think that anyone is the better for a boring artist and their art. At present, I do not think my picture is worthy of the advantages I received from you. That is, a, that is a sign that Van Gogh isn't a jerk. He's not saying, you know what, Theo, thanks for sending me the money, but you know what, I deserved it. I worked bloody hard, and I, I'm, um, I'm a big deal. So, you know what, I deserved the money that you sent me. He's saying, I don't think my picture's right now at present. Right now, I don't think my pictures are worthy of, of the advantages. In other words, Van Gogh is realistic, modest, hardworking, self, um, uh, self-disciplined, and He's able to, yeah, be self-sacrificing. Can, can you can you see how that statement is the opposite of selfish? That statement is, to some extent, self-sacrificing. To say, you know what? You sent me a lot of money, and right now I'm actually not even worthy of that. I'm going to need to really work hard to deserve it, right? And that is, you've got to think about that term. Now, I don't know. I don't think it's lack self-esteem. I don't think it's that. Um, I think he's just being realistic. He's developing as an artist, and, and he knows that's going to take time. And he says, um, you know, I don't think my pictures are worthy yet. But he, he does believe he's going to get there, and and they and he and he is going to get there. He is going to come up with this, right? He, um, this is in his future, right? This picture. 
so so he's right he's right um his pictures aren't worthy of the advantages that he's received but they will be and and um and and more so you know is, is art is it going to eventually become some of the most valuable beloved appreciated and respected in the in the world some of the most recognized art modern art in 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 art right and so it is going to become worthy it is in his future it is um it is um in the offing but it's not there yet and what i want you to think about is this idea of self-sacrifice where you say well you sent me a lot of money i don't actually deserve it i'm not going to work really hard because i need to earn what you've done for me that's kind of um that kind of discipline is is very um comes from a very modest place but but also a realistic place right and I want you to think about that idea of self-sacrifice and Zola and this, this the, what the pilgrim does. And then also in the context of the ear incident and in the con context of himself booking himself into the asylum and in the context of something happens where he gets shot and he takes the blame on himself, doesn't all of that add up to the same thing? And I think it was Gauguin, and we'll we'll touch on that. But Gauguin thought of Van Gogh as a martyr, someone who kind of was almost like Christ. You know, where Christ um, um, is crucified to save humanity, where where Van Gogh was allowing himself to be, in a way, crucified for his art. That was the way, the almost cynical way that. Van Gogh saw, um, sorry, Gauguin saw Van Gogh. I just want to see if I can find some something on that. So first of all, before I go on, let me just ask you guys, bear in mind, I've written a book, The Murder of Vincent Van Gogh. I don't know how many of you here have read that book. How many, how many of you have read this book? The Murder of Vincent van Gogh. If you haven't read it, you want to read it. It's available in paperback. I do recommend the Kindle version. It's got a lot of links. It's quite highly rated, 4.4 .4 out of 5, right? But the reason I'm bringing it up is to say I've obviously already gone down this road. I've already researched um, all of this, right? But my question to you guys, whether you've read the book or not, why am I suddenly out of focus? Uh, whether you've read the book or not is, do you think Van Gogh was a kind of martyr? Do you think that that is accurate to say that? Do you think it's it's um, true, or do you think it's a perception that's not true? It's, it's a perception. Snow Lion says, I want to read it. <laughs> well, you're welcome to if you want to. Jalsi says, not yet, but I will. I, I'm, every time I look at it, I'm like, when am I going to get my 40th review? And then it just never happens. So I'm holding out for my 40th review. Tani, good to see you. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Robbie says, is always self-sacrificed in some way. So if you've read the book um, 
Antani has. What do you say about this martyr aspect? Does that resonate or do you think it's not, not relevant? What do you guys say about it? Josie says in certain ways. Tani says he was a kind of martyr. Robbie says, oh, I'm trying to remember what you said. Okay, so we're going to jump very briefly into the future, and we're just going to look at very, very quickly at that aspect. And so we go to um, this article in The Guardian, um, and as I say, it is jumping a little bit into the future, but you've got Jonathan Jones saying, Van Gogh gouged by the Gorgon, uh, I don't believe it, right? Have I, um, anyway, and then he talks about the martyr aspect. Where does he say it? So, yeah, they talk about this theory that Van Gogh menaced Paul Gauguin and in a moment of madness, Gauguin whipped off his ear in self-defense. And then he says, he talks, he, he sort of talks about it. And I just want to see where he talks about, um, Martyr, is it somewhere here? Talks about he worked hard to persuade his hero Gauguin to come and live in the yellow house. Um, can you guys see the word? There it is. So it associates his injury with his vocation as an artist and a martyr. The question is, was he that much of a martyr? Was he that much of a martyr that he cut off his own ear? Was he that much of a martyr that he took his own life? I mean, I can understand that he's that much of a martyr that he sort of gives someone else the better room in the house, but a lot of people would do that. I don't think you'd say that's martyrdom, right? Anyway, so this is a, an article that disputes that entire version of events, right? This is a article that basically rubbishes that whole argument. But it, it, it challenges this idea, well, what kind of, if he was a martyr, a lot of people would say, to some degree, I think he would say, no, I'm not a martyr, I'm a pilgrim. I'm, this is kind of a, a heroic, humble journey, and I, I don't really expect anything for it. That's a little bit different to a martyr, I think. Um, There's also a reference in this article to martyr. I don't know if we can uh, find it very quickly. Um, see, look out for the word martyr. The Critics began to speak of Van Gogh as a martyr to the artistic cause, one of the isolated geniuses who populated the artistic uh, pantheon. But bear in mind that's critics, people who didn't like him, people who didn't know, understand him, said, you know what, he's a martyr, he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to get attention or something. Is that the, is that the, the impression you get of him? in his letter to, to Theo, that he's trying to be a martyr with Theo. When he says, at present, I do not think my picture is worthy of the advantages I've received from him. Does that strike you as someone who's being a martyr? Or is that someone who's just a genuine guy? He can sometimes be demanding, but he, but he can also be really genuine.
Okay. Do you see how it's a really interesting subject, that particular discussion? Then he says, but once they are worthy, I swear that you will have created them, that you will have created them as much as I, and that we are making them together. Isn't that a wonderful sentiment and especially moving given where we are today that, you know, Van Gogh's art today is priceless. It's worth millions. It's some of the most valuable art in the world. You know, if you actually make a list of the most valuable paintings in the world right now, I think he is number four on that list. By the way, Gauguin is, sorry, I don't know if he's number four. I think Gauguin is number four. He's something like number seven. But it's the, the top 10 is nevertheless an incredible position to occupy because uh, it's, it's really competitive, right? So he says, I will not say more about that because it will be as clear as daylight to you when I begin to do things more seriously. At the moment, I'm working on another size study canvas, another garden, or rather a walk under plain trees with the green turf and the black clumps of pines. I think it's a terrible picture, to be honest. I don't think it's very nice. Well, I wouldn't say it's terrible. I would just say it's kind of average. You did well to order the paints and the canvas because the weather is magnificent. Again, um, what what is Vincent's state of mind here? Is he feeling sorry for himself? Is he yearning for Gauguin to join him? Is he... Um, heartbroken, you know, did some girl break his heart? Is he um, missing his father? Is he um, sick? Is he um, struggling with motivation? This is, you know, this letter and some of the ones before this are some of his happiest letters you'll come across. If you go through his entire archive of so far about 700 letters, these letters that you're reading right now are some of the happiest that you'll find. He loves the light. He loves the, the, the he enjoys the color that surround him. He's in a good place, right? He says, we have the mistral, but there are calm intervals and then it is wonderful. He's saying it's magnificent. It's wonderful. If there were less mistral, this place would really be as lovely as Japan and would lend itself as well to art. As I was writing, a very kind letter arrived from Bernard. He is thinking of coming to all this winter, just a whim, but it is possible that Gauguin is sending him as a substitute and would rather stay in the north himself. Now, what I think is really interesting is It's almost like Bernard sees this opportunity and suddenly realizes if Gauguin seizes this opportunity, I'm going to lose it. So I'm going to seize this opportunity. And as soon as he decides that, Gauguin wakes up. Because just after this, communication that Bernard is thinking of coming to all that's when Gauguin says uh, uh, thanks I'm going to accept your, your offer I'm coming to all right the our soul is 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 uh, upon us we shall soon know because I'm convinced that he will write you one way or the other in his letter Bernard speaks of Gauguin with great respect and sympathy and I'm sure that they understand one another. And I really think that Gauguin has done Bernard good. Whether Gauguin comes or not, he will remain friends with us. And if he does not come now, he will come another time. I feel instinctively that Gauguin is a schemer. There you have it in a, in a nutshell. Is he right? He says, I feel instinctively that Gauguin is a schemer who, seeing himself at the bottom of the social ladder, 
wants to regain a position by means which will certainly be honest, but at the same time, very politic. So Van Gogh is kind of no, no, no uh, slouch, right? In the sense that he um, knows in a way who he's dealing with. He's not like so naive. He, he does know what he's dealing with or who he's dealing with. Do you see that? Is a cruel schema. So he goes on to say, he sees himself at the bottom of the social ladder. Well, to be clear, right now he sees himself that way, right? Right now he's down on his luck. And he wants to regain a position by means which will certainly be honest, but at the same time, very politic. Well, I don't know if I agree with the honest part, but he, he does want to regain a position. Do you think do you think Vincent wants the same thing? Do you think Vincent is a schemer who wants to regain a position on the social ladder? Vincent is trying to in a in a, in, in a way you could say it's kind of like being a Marty, is trying to create a artist colony for other artists. He's not really trying to elevate himself other than to make his art um, worthy of what his brothers um, sent him in terms of money. Um, but I suppose in a watered down way, Van Gogh also wants to, I wouldn't say regain a position because he's never had it, he wants to gain some sort of position for himself. Otherwise, why would he be, be interested in the yellow house to begin with, right? He'd be fooling himself if it wasn't to gain some sort of agency, right? He is getting some sort of agency. Uh, Robbie says, do you think Vincent was still unprepared for how bad Gauguin was? Um, so, tough one to answer. Um, yeah, I think he was partially prepared, but also I think he wasn't fully prepared. I also don't, I, I think when he, when he, anticipated Gauguin going to him. I think the last thing he thought was that Gauguin would then also leave him, right? Um, Gauguin little knows that I'm able to take all this into account, and perhaps he does not know that it is absolutely necessary for him to gain time, and that with us he will gain that if he gains nothing else. So I think um, a big, a big um, thing that Vincent underestimates is he thinks that <coughs> he thinks that Gauguin is in exactly the same situation that he's in. In other words, if I settle down and I work very hard and I'm diligent and focused and consistent and kind of stable, I guess, then then, um, then then that is what is necessary to come out on the other end where one wants to be or needs to be. Whereas Gauguin isn't thinking that at all. Gauguin is thinking, I'm in a bind. I need some money fast. And when I have that money, then, then I'm going to do what I really want to do. So 
Gauguin is using the Van Goghs to deal with a temporary kind of setback in his fortunes, whereas Vincent has kind of been in the struggle mode, the struggle place for years. And what, what's going to happen is an artist is going to come into his orbit, essentially, spend two months there, and then just like that, his art is going to sell again, and then that artist is going to be gone. And in a way, that's going to be a shock to Van Gogh. It's going to be unsettling. Um, it's going to be, to some extent, invalidating. It's going to be a betrayal in a way. It's going to be a, an unpleasant surprise, right? In a way, Gauguin brings the real art world into Vincent's home where it's like, well, I am accepted, you not. I'm good enough, you not. I'm understood, you not. And, and I'm an arsehole. And, but that doesn't matter. Does that make sense? I sometimes feel like that on YouTube. I look at someone on YouTube that I don't, I don't particularly respect or like or agree with. And they're incredibly successful. And then you think, you know what I mean? And that's exactly what's going to happen to him. He's going to have someone that he does actually respect until he doesn't, well, I wouldn't say that, I don't know if he changes his mind, but I think he's treated really badly. And I think he kind of realizes in a way, well, this is really unfair, right? This is really unfair. Anyway, so he says, if someday he decamps from Pont Arben with Laval or Morin without paying his debts, his debts, I think in this in his case he would still be justified. I think I'm going to put my glasses on. <clears throat> exactly like any other creature at bay, I do not think it would be wise to offer Bernard straight off 150 francs for a picture every month. As, as you did Gauguin. So can you see what um, is actually what is actually suggesting is he's going to give Gauguin 150 francs for a picture every month. That's kind of the deal. He says Bernard has evidently been over and over the whole business with Gauguin. Isn't he rather counting on taking Gauguin's place? I think it will be necessary to be very firm and very explicit about the whole thing. And without giving any reasons to speak very plainly, I cannot blame Gauguin, speculator though he may, he may be, as soon as he wants to risk something in business, only I will have nothing to do with it. I would a thousand times rather go on with you, whether you are with the Goupils or not. And in my opinion, you know, the new dealers are exactly and in every way the same as the old. In principle and in theory, I am, an, I am for an association of artists who guarantee each other's work and living. But in principle and in theory, I'm equally against attempts to destroy old established businesses. Let them rot in peace and die a natural death. It is pure presumption to hope to regenerate trade. Have nothing to do with it. Let's guarantee a living amongst ourselves. Live like a family, like brothers and friends. That's how he's seeing this next phase of his life. Do you think Gauguin is thinking anything like that? He says, and, and this, even if it should not succeed, I would like to be in this, but I will never have anything to do with an attack on other dealers. With a handshake, and I hope that what I have been obliged to ask you will not be too terribly inconvenient, but I did not want to postpone sleeping at home. And in case you're short yourself, 20 francs more will get me through the week, but it is urgent. Ever yours, Vincent. There's something I meant to mention here. So... Kind of what's happening now is there's a little bit of a 
competition going on now where it seems like both Bernard and Gauguin, you're going to see Gauguin now wants to come to uh, all himself. There's already a little bit of a competition. Oh, I've decided I want to go. No, 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 I want to go. Then in the post trip, he says, I'm keeping all Bernard's letters, and they are sometimes really interesting. You shall read them someday. There's quite a bundle already. When I said that we must be firm with Gauguin, it is only because you had already given your opinion when he told you his plan of action in Paris. You made him a good answer then without committing yourself, but also without wounding his self-respect. And the same thing may become necessary again. I think I shall see Millier today. Right, that's the um, the soldier that he thinks of as the lover. Thank you in advance for the Japanese things. We must be firm with Gauguin. Why? Why do you think it's necessary to even say that? Why must? Th why must he say that? Do you agree that it's because Gauguin is a schemer? Gauguin is an opportunist. Gauguin is um, a person who plays psychological games. Um, I think I put the wrong thing there. It needs to be this one. Gauguin is pushy, is selfish, he is demanding, is a user. Yeah, all those things. I think the next letter is a letter from Gauguin, or is it the, the one after? So here's a letter from Vincent to Emile Bernard, and then the next one, oh damn, it's the one after this. Here's the letter from Paul Gauguin. I'm starting to run out of, my, my throat's just feeling a little bit raw. Um, so let's, let's, I want to end off on the letter from Paul Gauguin. So I might need to go and get another glass of water. Because that one's finished. Okay. <clears throat> by three letters to go. Vincent to Emile Bernan, bear in mind it's it's talking about this, well, you imagine he's going to be talking about, oh, do you want to come and stay here? Thanks for your letter, but I'm somewhat surprised to hear you say, oh, impossible to do Gauguin's portrait. Why impossible? What nonsense is this? I won't insist, and we won't say another word about this exchange once and for all. So on his part too, Gauguin hasn't even thought of doing yours. Right? Um, again, our soul, right? <laughs> Insensitive, selfish. He says, such fellows call themselves portraitists, living so long together and not making up their minds to pose for each other. And they will separate, they will separate without having painted each other's portrait. Well, guess what? When Gauguin and Van Gogh live together, and they both paint one another's portraits as kind of fireworks because the way Van Gogh paints Gauguin tells you something that they're not getting along. And when Gauguin paints Vincent, tells you what Gauguin thinks of Vincent. Anyway, he says, well then, I hope someday to paint your portrait and Gauguin's myself as soon as we get together, which is bound to happen. In short, I think that I'm going to do the portrait of the second lieutenant of the Zouaves, whom I told you about, and who is on the point of leaving for Africa. Now, you can imagine that he has told Bernard about Millier because he really admires this guy's way with women. And one wonders, where are those letters? Like, what has the Van Gogh family or whomever done with those letters where he talks to Bernard about what he likes about Millier. Where are those letters? Where is he going to talk about that here? 
why haven't you replied with a single word to my question about your intentions with regard to your military service? Now let's speak for a moment about your saying that you are thinking of coming here and spending the winter in all. I've ex expressly installed myself in such a way that I can put somebody up if necessary. But what if Gorgan comes? So that is his concern. It's sort of like, um, Bernard, I, I see you'd like to come here and there is a place for you, but what if Gauguin wants to come? What are you going to do then? He has not definitely declined the offer yet, but even if I could take you in, I don't see how you could feed yourself well at less than three francs a day, and I should prefer to say four francs. He's kind of saying, um, uh, Bernard, you're welcome to come and stay here, but not if Gauguin comes, right? And, you know, the fact is, Bernard's not a really good artist. Um, Gauguin is the preferred candidate in terms of the art aspect. Bernard's probably the nicer guy, but he is not much of an artist. Of course, if we were hard up, we could have a lot of cheap meals in the studio. We can certainly always economize in this way. But I tell you, life is a little more expensive than, than at pont -Arven. I think you are only paying 2.50 francs a day, aren't you? board, lodging, and everything included. And if what would tempt you the most, you were going to paint in the brothels, which is most certainly excellent. It can't be done for free for nothing here. So that is his um, best pal, one of his best friends, likes to go and paint in the brothels. And Vincent thinks that's a great idea. And that is the other side of Vincent van Gogh that we don't really think about or know about. Hence that picture of Melier above his bed, right? Corin Sanderson, hi from Wisconsin, welcome. So let it go until you have your uniform. In this respect, soldiers here and elsewhere can get a lot of things free for nothing. Take my own case. It is true that I've just done that study of the night cafe, but nevertheless, though it is a free love hotel, from where, from time to time, you may see a whore sitting at a table with her fellow. I myself have not been able to do a brothel in the exact sense of the word, just because if I were to do it a little satisfactorily and seriously, it would cost me more money than I can possibly afford. So, can you imagine Vincent? talking in this way to Theo, can you imagine Vincent talking to Theo also about, I don't know if I feel strong enough financially to bring it off. I mean, if Vincent goes to a brothel, who's actually paying for that? So that's also an aspect that he keeps from Theo, not because it's not happening, but because Theo's probably not going to like where some of his money is going if he, if he really knew all the details. Then he says, now listen, I don't want to say that we shan't go and have a glass of beer there. Where do you think he's talking about? What do you think he's talking about there? I don't want to say that we we shan't go, shan't go where, and have a glass of beer there, have a glass of beer where. We shall make acquaintances there, and we shall work partly from imagination, partly from model. Where is he talking about? Where is he talking about? And the other thing that's really important to note here is we are at the um, 18th of September, right? And we, we are constantly asking the question, how is Van Gogh? How is his mental state? How is his physical state? And one of the things he admits is he says, I myself have not been able to do a brothel. Uh, what, what does he say? Um, I refrain from starting that picture until I feel strong enough financially. So, 
Uh, do you think I'm right? Do you, do you think it's the correct interpretation to say when he says, I myself have not been able to do a brothel, doesn't that suggest that he's not been going to brothels? Do you, do you agree with that? He, he talks about not being able to do that, but then he says, I refrain as well. He talks about it, how much it's going to cost him, right? And bear in mind, he can't afford that sort of thing when he's furnishing a house. So no matter what he was doing in, um, I don't know, the other months, February, March, April, May, he needs to be spending his time and money and attention on the house. And so he's absolutely right. He can't afford to be doing that when all of his hopes and aspirations and attention is on the house. So one of the things that, bear in mind, Van Gogh had syphilis. And one of the things that worsened syphilis is obviously going to a brothel. And we see him very healthy, very happy, doing an interlude between going to brothels and not going to brothels, right? And here he actually admits that he hasn't been able to do a brothel. And doesn't that mean, well, he hasn't actually been going to a brothel? He says, again, I refrain. Then he says, I don't want to say that we shan't go. We shall work partly from the imagination. And if we should want to, I don't say it would be impossible to do it. But at present, for, for one, I'm in no hurry at all. But at present, I, for one, am in no hurry at all. Isn't he kind of saying, when he's saying that, he's basically saying, um, right now, I'm not in a hurry to go to a brothel. Well, I'm not in a hurry to go and paint people in brothels. Plans are often fall through, however well the calculations are made, whereas by relying on chance and working from day to day without any fixed purpose, one does a lot of unexpected things. Gary continues talking about brothels. Right? And he seems to know that soldiers have a lot of fun in brothels. He says... I cannot possibly recommend to you to come here for the express purpose of painting brothels. I repeat, once you are a soldier, you will have a splendid opportunity for that. And it would probably be as well for your sake to, to wait until you have your uniform. So Van Gogh seems to be thinking, cheapest with your uniform on, you're going to have a grand old time with the ladies. And he seems to know that based on his... Friendship with Melier, right? He says, the thing I want to say to you clearly and frankly is go spend your time in Africa. The South will charm you and make a great artist out of you. Gauguin himself owes his superiority to the South. I myself have, <coughs> I myself have now seen the strongest sunlight here for months. And the result is that after this experience, those who maintain their position best from the point of view of color are Delacroix and Monticelli, those painters of whom it is said erroneously nowadays that they are pure romantics, fellows with an exaggerated imagination. In short, you see, the South, which is painted so dryly by Jerome and Fromentine, is from here, all, and already essentially a country whose Intimate charm can be interpreted only by the color of the colorist. I hope you will write me again soon. So ultimately in this letter, he, he talks a lot about brothels and we're going to have a lot of fun in brothels, but become a soldier first. Maybe you shouldn't come here right now. That, that's kind of what the message of his letter. I wouldn't venture to take it upon yourself to urge anyone to come here. If someone comes here of his own accord, well, that's his own business. But as for recommending it, I'll never do that. As for me, I'll stay here. And of course, I should be pleased if you were to spend the winter here. And that's kind of the bottom line of this letter. It is, 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 is seems to be saying, it seems to be sensing that Gauguin might want to take advantage of the offer. And is sensing that Bernard might mess that up. And so he's saying, 
It will be great if you join us in winter. Right? He's saying, Bernard, you we really, really like you, and you would be completely welcome here. We would love to have you come and stay here in winter. Right? Yeah, you uh, you've got it. <clears throat> okay, I am gonna go and get a glass of water. Um, the next letter is from Vincent to Theo, and then it's the very last one that we're going to deal with. I'll see you guys in a moment. Tell me what you're doing. So before we continue, something that I should tell you guys about is it's really pretty incredible. I must try and try and get a photo. Um, a weaver bird is now building, if it's the same one, is it must be now building its 14th or 15th nest. Uh, it really is really quite quite crazy. So something that I find really incredible is the yellow weaver actually goes from bright yellow in summer to kind of a, a dirty green in winter. And I didn't, I mean, how many birds do you know that actually change their plumage annually or seasonally? I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I think there are some Arctic creatures that do that. Uh, I don't know if the snowy owl does that, but there are very few birds that change their plumage like this. I mean, I can't think of too many other examples. Um, I don't think he has had success. In fact, if I could give him a tip, I would say, dude, she doesn't like this tree. You should maybe move on. Maybe I should as well. You should maybe go to another garden and, and give up on this, this um, what's the word, uh, lost cause. Um, you know, you've, you've tried, you've made a... Uh, a good go of it, um, go somewhere else. You know, you might be happier there. I think it's good advice for me as well. Um, let me just see if I can bring that up. In non-breeding season, these colors fade to a less con conspicuous shade. It's quite, it really is quite incredible. Let's see if I can show you some pictures of yeah so i guess this is it
can you see on screen um, that that is the um, well that's the male that's the female but but the male is looking like the female out of season that's what's kind of strange Let's just uh, quickly touch on this while we're on the subject. Polynias, Poly, Polynus, territorial colonial nester. I guess that Polynus is, I guess, the bird version of polygamous. They may have up to seven females in one breeding season. I mean, I think these are the Van Goghs of birds, right? Um, they live in colonies of 2 to 20 males. Each builds multiple nests with a small territory, which it vigorously defends against intruders. Females test how sturdy a nest is by put it, pulling at material in the inside. If it is accepted, the female adopts a hunched posture. Okay. Then um, does it say anything about them changing color? They are initially fed by the female. Male takes a greater role in providing food. The young leave the nest at about 17 days old. That's pretty incredible. These are pretty independent creatures. I just want to see if I can find... Uh, so here's another article about it. Um, Southern Mast Weaver. It says adult male in breeding, and then that's spelled wrong, but breeding, breeding plumage. Breeding. Doesn't really, what does it say about breeding? Um, nest building. Doesn't really say. Mast weaver plumage changes season. Breeding plumage. The male lesser mast weaver in breeding colors has a black mask. It changes color during the breeding season. Eclipse plumage. How many other birds have this? Sorry, I'm going to get back to. I'm going to get back to Van Gogh in a moment. Uh, it says here. Eclipse plumage typical of ducks, but found in other birds as well is dull female-like plumage worn by the male for a month or more in summer after breeding. It eclipses his usual bright plumage. Did you know that? Did you know that birds do that? I must add, I don't think I knew that the weaver did that. Are they... Animals that do that, like, is, isn't the um, Arctic fox or one of those animals, don't they do that? I know snakes molt and so on. Um, sheep uh, also molt to some extent. Um, so here it is. The male lesser moss weaver has a black mask that has eclipse plumage, meaning it changes color during the breeding season. The reason why I say that is because the bird outside my window looks like a juvenile. It looks kind of like a female building the nest. 
and I, I'm pretty sure it's the same one. It's just in its eclipse winter plumage. That's all. Um, to see if I can uh, find a picture that ex that shows that. Uh, Eclipse Plumage Weaver. Doesn't really, can't, can't quite, quite find it here. Okay. Anyway, I just thought that was quite interesting. Uh, Snow lines is British. Long ears molt like crazy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's let's continue, shall we? Sorry about that. I just have a. My dear Theo, many thanks for your letter and the 100 franc note it contained. Millier also came this morning, bringing me the package of Japanese stuff and other things. Among them are very much like the cabaret in two sheets, with a line of violet girl musicians against the yellow lighted wall. I did not know that print, and there are several others which are unknown to me. There is one, a woman's head, which must belong to a good school. I've just bought a dressing table with everything necessary and my own little room is complete. The other one, Gorgans or another lodges, but probably not Bernard's, still needs a dressing table and a chest of drawers. And downstairs, I shall need a big frying pan and a cupboard. There is no hurry for this, and I already can see myself earning enough to be safe for a long time to come. You cannot think what peace of mind it gives me. I'm so set on making an artist's home, but one for practical use and not the ordinary studio full of knickknacks. So we are now at the 22nd of September, and by his own admission, he says, he talks about the peace of mind that he's enjoying, right? And if you think about it, what, what, um, how can I put it? One, one aspect that is missing from his experience, his daily life, while he's enjoying this peace of mind, is, is sort of putting together a home, is decorating the home, is thinking about the home, is thinking about the future, is thinking in, in a kind of a domestic, is in a domestic setting and is thinking in a domestic way, right? which is different to thinking about going to a brothel and all the thoughts and behaviors that are associated with that, right? The other thing that's important to bear in mind is, so what I'm trying to say is right now, it's almost like Van Gogh is a good boy. That is um, thoughts and actions are directed uh, to something practical and affirming, I guess, if that's the word, right? And, and, and women aren't really part of that thing, not directly, right? At the other side of the story, when all is said and done and his ear is bleeding and he's about to lose his home and he's going to be devastated, Part of that story is he goes and gives his ear to a prostitute. And so isn't something that happens between now and Christmas of, of, of the same year, doesn't he fall in love with a prostitute and maybe, maybe Gauguin and Vincent fall in love with the same woman or want to be with the same woman or are at loggerheads over the same woman? In other words, isn't part of this catastrophe 
isn't it in part fueled by um, uh, sexual appetite unleashed and one woman in particular doing that and two stubborn artists that are that are used to getting their own way or whatever uh, are eventually cross purposes because it's not just that he loses his ear there's a woman that comes into the story he, he actually gives his ear to this prostitute well he had to know her to begin with so, so why does he do that I don't know if it's love, it could be sex, but what I'm trying to say is in the one story where he's, he's living happily and healthily and is in a mentally good place, um, he's not going to brothels, he's not drinking absinthe, right? He's just doing something else, that's the point. In the other thing that ends in kind of carnage, that's exactly what he is doing. And so isn't part of the answer to the ear incident brothels and drinking? And if that is the answer, then, then who leads him astray? Who, who, um, who invites Van Gogh back to pleasure land? I'm not saying that Van Gogh was never the kind of dude to be interested in pleasure land, but he hasn't been going to pleasure land for the time being, and, and that is why he's become so strong and so happy, like part of happiness is health, right? And so what ends that, what, what, what brings to an end that period of mental health and physical health? Well, I think it's a combination, not only of, of um, what, but who, right? And so, Again, I'm trying to address this question of, so was Van Gogh mad? Well, where's any sign of it here? So in other words, if he's not drinking and he's not womanizing and there's not somebody to argue with, then isn't he completely fine? <laughs> Lending an ear, yeah. Okay, so is... Uh, is, is what is happening becoming clearer to you guys? Is the, are the dynamics that are coming into play, are they becoming clear? Right, so he goes on to say, um, he talks about his peace of mind. He said, I'm so set on making an artist's home. I'm also thinking of planting two oleanders in tubs in front of the door. So can you see how he's even gardening? Right? The last thing he's doing is drinking and womanizing. After all, we shall probably spend several times fewer hundreds of francs than Russell. For example, we'll spend thousands. And truly, even if I could choose between the two for my own part, I should rather have the 100 franc method, so long as every piece of furniture is solid and big. But the room where I shall put up anybody who comes this way will be like a boudoir. Hmm. And when it is finished, you will see that it will not be a haphazard production, but a deliberate creation. The text of Bing's Japon is rather dry and uh, leaves something to be desired. He says there is a great individual art, but though he gives a few scraps of it, he gives you no real impression of the character of that art. <clears throat> Have you read Madame... Chrysanthemid, chrysanthemum, chrysanthemid. How do you say that? Bria, are you here? How do you say, is it Madame Chrysanthemum? The sense of tranquility that the houses bought, the sense of tranquility that the houses bought me mainly amounts to this. So that's another thing. He talks about the sense of tranquility that he has. It's over and over again, he talks about feeling at peace, happy, how marvelous the colors are, how wonderful the weather is, right? Here, it, here's another um, 
another reference to how happy he is and how stable he is. The sense of tranquility that the house has brought me mainly amounts to this, that from now on, I feel I'm working to provide for the future so that after me, another painter will find a going concern. I shall need time, but I'm obsessed with the idea of painting such decorations for the house as will be worth the money spent on me during the years in which I was unproductive. She says, I'm obsessed with the idea of painting decorations for the house. And so while he's obsessed with that, he's not obsessed with going to a brothel. That's what sort of um, his priority, certainly right now. Then he says, mother's photograph gave me very great pleasure because you can see that she's well and because she still has such a lively expression, but I do not care for it at all as a real likeness. So Yeri is criticizing photography. He says, you know, just thanks a lot for sending a photo of mom. Um, it's good to see that she's well, but I don't like it at all because it's not a good likeness. So yeah, you have a, a painter, bear in mind photography is quite a new thing and it's kind of in competition with um portraitists right artists of who, who do portraits then he says i've just painted my own portrait in the same ashen coloring and unless we are painted in color the result is nowhere near speaking likeness so again he's trying to he's trying to um come up with a good and appropriate response to the threat of photography. Um, Tanny says, must he be obsessed? Well, he's an intense guy and he's also kind of lonely. And so he tends to go from, I won't say one obsession to another, but he um, he definitely follows his passions, whether it's color, woman, an idea, a place, a concept like Cyprus's. Uh, he definitely is an intense fellow. Okay. So he goes on to say, just because I had taken a terrific amount of trouble to get the combination of ashen and graping tones, I could not like the portrait in black and white. Would Germini Lasseteau really be Germini Lasseteau without her color? Obviously not. How would like to have painted portraits of her own family? So can you see what is really quite fascinating here is... Van Gogh doesn't just emerge out of the ether in a vacuum. He emerges out of the ether at the same time that black and white photography, and look at the picture behind me, uh, black and white photography comes into, into the human story. And so the, don't the artists, not only Van Gogh, but the artists around him, aren't they trying to overcompensate? In other words, Photography comes into onto the scene, and you start seeing it in newspapers and, and things. A, a new, a new um, thing called a magazine, right? And the artists sort of feel, wow, we've got to, you know, what? Actually, that's really incredible. You 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 touch a button, and the next thing there's a black and white version of reality that is absolutely true to reality, right? Maybe with a little bit of over or under exposure distortion. But nevertheless, you've got this incredible thing that represents reality. Well, what do what is left for us to work with? Answer, color. And that, that is, of course, until color photography came onto the scene. So what do the artists do is they say, let's overemphasize color. Let, let's really make the focus color. The one thing that photography can't sort of the, the one area that photography can't compete on, right? Then you kind of get a sense that it's an overcompensation 
that they feel threatened, they feel intimidated by the advent of photography, and they've got every reason to be, because photographs now present an alternative to paintings, to portraits, to someone recording a thing for, you know, a, you know, like you get a, a court sketch or a, like a sketch artist in court, or you can have a photographer. But you can imagine if you've got a photographer and a sketch artist, who do you think they're going to use, what they're going to use? And we, we sort of, I, I had that in the Laurie Vallow trial where sitting right next to me was a sketch artist. Why was she there? Well, because cameras weren't allowed in the courtroom, right? But if they were, do you think she would have been there? Yeah, that's right. I think, didn't color photography only come about like in the 60s? So it's not just that Van Gogh is color obsessed or very interested in color. It's within the context of black and white photography. The same with Monet. Monet paints cityscapes that sort of have like a smoky haze in front of them. Well, maybe a camera couldn't pick that up. And so that is what he chooses to focus. What he chooses to focus on. So anyway, he says, um, <clears throat> for the second time, I've scraped off a study of Christ with the angel in the Garden of Olives. You see, I can see real olives here, but I cannot, or rather, I will not paint any more without models. But I have the thing in my head with the colors: a starry night, the figure of Christ in blue. So there you have it again. He's got Starry Night. He's mentioned it how many times already that, he, that he's, he's very hypnotized and mesmerized by the Starry Night, the, the, this vivid twinkling. Uh, what, what is the word that he used? Can you remember what word he used to describe it? It wasn't twinkling. It was um, something else. The figure of Christ in blue, all the strongest blues, and the angel blended citron yellow. I think he said the spangling stars, something like that. Um, and every shade of violet from blood red purple to ashen in the, in the landscape. So another thing that he feels that black and white photography can't convey is, is motion, is uh, animation, is emotion. And so... In paintings like Starry Night, it tries to um, uh, it tries to enliven his art and, and give it a vivid life. It tries to give it a pulsating liveliness because a, a still black and white photo is, is kind of flat and dead and dull. And so he tries to overcompensate by actually making it um, um, vibrate and... Um, I'm trying to think of other words besides vibrate. Um, and you, you get a real sense of that vibrating, elect, electric, pulsating um, liveliness in the animated Loving Vincent, where they literally do animate his, his actual oil paintings, and you can see how, how naturally that comes about. It, it really does feel like Van Gogh is seeing this vivid tapestry uh, in motion, and is trying to um, is trying to capture the um, the vibrations, the, um, the 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 animated light and life that he sees around him, right? Yeah, swirling is also a good word. Okay, so he says, um, I have been to get five size steady stretches. Well, that's, okay, five. So I have even more ideas. I'm having the pictures and I'm keeping it framed in oak and walnut. It will take time, but you'll see later on. I hope that you will give me some details of your visit to Maureen. I like the drawing of the two women in the carriage tremendously. 
even if it is some time before anyone comes here to stay with me, it won't make me change my mind about this step being urgent and being useful in the long run. This art that we are working in, we feel has a long future before it, and one must be quietly settled like steady people and not like decadence. If only he took his own advice. <laughs> if only he took his own advice. Yes, Vincent, you must be quietly settled. You must be steady. You mustn't be decadent. And guess what's going to happen in the next two months? He's going to become unsettled. He's going to become unsteady. He's going to become extremely decadent at the as like Gorgan's wingman, right? Um, and so he's got the he's, he's in the right place. He's in the right space. Yeah, my life will become more and more like a Japanese painter's living close to nature like a petty tradesman. And that, you well know, is a less gloomy affair than the decadence way. If I can live long enough, I shall be something like old Tangi. It's funny that he says, you know, that way is a less gloomy affair than the decadence way. Well, he's, you know, like a year from now. He's going to be in a very gloomy affair as a result of the decadence that, that's right in front of him. After all, we don't really know anything about our own personal future. Wow, this is such a pretentious letter. But we nevertheless feel that impressionism will last. Goodbye for the present and good luck and many, many thanks for all your kindness. I think that I shall put the Japanese things downstairs in the studio. A handshake ever yours, Vincent. And now at last we come to Gauguin. Letter from Paul Gauguin to Vincent van Gogh from Brittany, 22nd September 1888. By the way, I've been to Brittany. Um, Mont Saint Michel is, I think, in Brittany. Let's see if I can bring it up. I actually slept. In the courtyard of the Mont Saint Michel. Uh, it's actually not in Brittany, it's in Normandy, but Normandy is right next to Brittany. So, anyway, that's the area. Okay. Where were we? Okay, so let's read this letter. And by the way, this letter is essentially, in a way, the beginning of the end for Vincent, right? This letter and what it portends is essentially the beginning of the end. And I'm going to highlight a couple of red flags in this letter. My dear Vincent, it has taken me a long time to answer you. What do you expect? My sickly state and sorrow often leave me in a state of prostration when I lock myself up in inaction. If you knew my life, you'd understand that after having struggled so much in every way, I am just now catching my breath, and at this moment, I'm dormant. Just think how totally opposite Gauguin is to Vincent. Vincent is activated, he's motivated, he's busy, right? And look at... Look at um, Look at uh, Gauguin, he's, he's feeling sorry for himself. He's stuck. He's doing nothing, right? Then he says, your exchange project to which I haven't yet answered smiles at me and I will do the portrait you want, though not yet, right? He's saying, you know, I'll, I'll do what you're saying, but I'm not going to do it right now. What else, what else do you have to do? So already that should be a bit of a warning. Um, right? So that's the first warning. I will do the portrait you, you want, but not yet. But although I'm not doing anything else, I'm dormant. I'm locked in inaction. Really? This is the guy you want to come and stay with you? So that's the first red flag. I'm not up to doing it, seeing as it is not a copy of a face that you want, but a portrait, as I understand a portrait to be. 
I watch little Bernard and I don't yet possess him. I will perhaps do it from memory. In any case, it will be an abstraction. Maybe tomorrow. I don't know. It will come to me all at once. Right now, we're having a spell of good weather, which leads both of us to try many things. I just did a religious painting, very poorly done, but which was interesting to do and which pleases me. I wanted to give it to the church at Pont Arvon. Naturally, they don't want it. Here's another little red flag. He refers to Bernard as little Bernard. It's a kind of a condescending statement. So you've kind of got a lazy, inactive, self-pitying dude that, who's nevertheless got contempt for the guy right next to him. He calls him little Bernard. Then he says, groups of Brittany women pray, very intense black costumes, very bright yellow-white headdresses. Uh, the two headdresses on the right are like monstrous helmets. A dark purple apple tree crosses through the painting with foliage drawn in masses like emerald green clouds with intervals of yellow green sunlight. The pure vermilion land at the church, it slopes down and becomes red brown. Now, you, you would imagine when you see that, that maybe since they are both artists, they're going to have something in common. They can talk about color. They can talk about proportions. They can talk about the things that they notice. They can talk about women. The angel is dressed in violet, ultramarine, blue, and Jacob bottle green. The angel's wings are pure chromium yellow one. The angel's hair, chromium two, and orange flesh-colored feet. I think I've succeeded in creating a great rustic and superstitious simplicity in the faces. The whole thing is very severe. The cow under the tree is very small compared to life and rears up. In this painting, I find that the landscape and the fight exist only in the imagination of the people who pray after the sermon. That's why there is a contrast between the life-sized people and the unnatural and disproportionate fight in its landscape. In your letter, you seem angry at our laziness in regard to the portrait, and that makes me sad. Friends don't get mad. At a distance, words cannot be interpreted in their true value. So the other thing just to note is he seems to be interested in things that Van Gogh is no longer interested in. So he talks about he's doing a religious painting. He talks about um, superstitious. It talks about a kind of tension between the life-size people and the unnatural disproportionate fight in the landscape. Look at look at the words that he uses. He talks. He says angry. He talks about fight. He, there's the word fight again. He talks about laziness, fight, mad. These are all his words. Do you, do you, do you see really any of these words in Vincent van Gogh's letters? I mean, you, how, you can go through five of his letters, 10 of his letters, 20 of his letters. Do you, are you going to come across these words? Let me go through them again. He talks about religious paintings, which Van Gogh, strictly speaking, he doesn't paint Christ, really, although he's just mentioned it in his previous letter, but he generally doesn't do that, right? Also, Van Gogh doesn't feel sorry for himself. He doesn't say, I, I locked myself up in, in action. Um, I'm dormant. Um I'll do the portrait, but not yet. I'm not up to doing it, right? Maybe tomorrow, I don't know. Is like kind of uncertain. 
But some of the words that he uses that you wouldn't expect Van Gogh to use, violent, um, superstitious, very severe, fight, um, fight again, you seem angry, laziness, um, and then mad, right? And and then the question is, are any of these words, I mean, am I just plucking them out of thin air and, and making something out of nothing? Because guess what? Gauguin and Vincent are going to argue. Vincent's going to be like, well, I'm working so hard and fast. You hardly do any work and you still sell your stuff. <laughs> You, you're getting recognized and whatnot, but you, you really haven't been working very much. That's pretty invalidating, right? That's got to be pretty invalidating. Then he says, you twist a dagger in the wound when you insist on proving to me that I've got to come south, knowing I suffer by not being there right now, right? A little bit of psychological games going on there but also a very interesting choice of words. Very interesting choice of words that is already used just in this one letter, right? Then he says, uh, when you invited me to come there with your scheme, and do you remember that Vincent described Gauguin as a schemer to his brother in a letter just a few letters ago? Now he's talking about a scheme. That, that Vincent's got a scheme. I formally wrote you one last affirmative letter, happy with your brother's offer. There is no way I can form a studio in the north since every day I hope to sell something which would allow me to get out of here. So he's basically saying that I accept your brother's offer right here. He's also saying something about that would allow me to get out of here. Guess what? When he's in all, he's going to feel exactly the same way. I need X, Y, Z because I need to get out of here. Right? That's exactly what's going to happen when he's in all, is he's going to very quickly say, I need to get out of here. So is someone who doesn't seem to be terribly easy to please. The people who feed me and the doctor who cured me did it on credit and would never take a painting or scrap of clothing from me and are splendid toward me. Do you think that that's maybe a little bit manipulative? Are you going to be splendid toward me? I cannot let them down without committing a misdeed, which would bother me very much. Well, does it, how does he let Vincent down? Vincent's almost bled to death. He's lost his ear and he just abandons him. But he, he feels like he can't abandon the people that have fed him and the doctor who cured him. I cannot let them down without, communicate, without committing a misdeed, which would bother me very much. Really? Do you think it would bother him very much? Y Yeri is actually talking about a misdeed. He's talking about, what's another word for a misdeed? I don't want to say crime, but what is another word for a misdeed? He brings it up. He's, uh, another word for a misdeed, misdeed. is a wrongdoing, a, a crime or a felony, an evil deed. Misdeed. Right? And that's the word that he chooses to use. He says, I will wait then. What he says, if they were either rich or thieves, it wouldn't matter to me. I will wait then. For example, if that day came and you were in a different frame of mind and had to tell me too late, I'd prefer that you do it right away. I'm afraid that your brother who loves my talent will price it too high. If he finds a collector or a speculator who is tempted by low prices, let him do it. I'm a man of sacrifices and I would like him to understand that I approve of whatever he does. Do you think that that's true? Do you think that he is a man of sacrifices? He 
He also says, um, he do, oh, I know. Yes, I just plucked a hair using this side of the. He also talks about rich and thieves. It's just interesting where his mind is. It's just really interesting where his mind is in terms of the words that he's, he uses. He talks about if you were in a different frame of mind, and, and guess who's going to be one of the biggest proponents of the Van Gogh is mad narrative? Where do you think it's going to come from ultimately? Let me ask you the question in a different way. How do you think that the story started that Van Gogh was mad, insane, um, whatever you want to, any other word you want to substitute for mad? Where, where do you think that that story came from? Do you think people um, saw him go to the asylum and then said, oh, he's mad? Do you think that's where it came from? No, it came from Gauguin. Gauguin, to explain why he left all, he said, well, I can't live with this guy, he's mad. To explain why um, Van Gogh lost his ear, Vincent's mad. To explain why Van Gogh died the way he died, Vincent's mad. And guess what? Everybody swallowed that story hook, line, and sinker? Was it the truth? Was it easy to believe under the circumstances? Probably. Was it true? Right? And so that is why if we gradually build up to that, those events, let's ask that same question right now. What's wrong with Vincent's state of mind right now? Before Gauguin gets there, what's wrong with Vincent's state of mind? Is he mad? Is he is he um, in a strange frame of mind? Is he unstable? Is he insane? Should he go to this? Shouldn't he go to the asylum right now? Right? I'm uh, I'm serious. If Van Gogh is mad and he was mad all along and he was a mad artist, shouldn't he just stop what he's doing right now with the yellow house and just go straight to the asylum. Do you see my point? Now, if, if you say, no, 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 I, I don't think you should go to the asylum right now, why not? Why not? I mean, why? Why, why shouldn't he go to the asylum right now? Uh, Lynn Lippi says, according to your book, it wasn't true. Yeah, that's right. But you see my point. So before Gauguin, Vincent is completely fine. He has his ear and he has his sanity. Once Gauguin comes into the picture, suddenly Van Gogh's mad. Let's uh, let's continue. Little Bernard will bring several of my paintings to Paris with him shortly. It's funny how that's how he refers to him. Laval plans to meet me in the Midi sometime in uh, February, obviously the next year. He found someone who will pay him 150 francs per month for a year. Now it seems to me, my dear Vincent, that you count badly. I know the prices in the South. Besides the restaurant, I'm responsible for a house of three people for 200 francs per month, including food. I've kept up my household and I know how to get along, even more so with four. Do you, do you think he's being honest when he says that? He, he talks about, I am responsible for a house of three people. Do you think that that's true? Do, do you think he has been looking after his wife and, and children? Then he says, as for housing besides yours, Laval and Bernard have 
could have a small furnished bedroom nearby. So can you see how he's kind of seems to be um, kind of negotiating by, by saying, you've offered me something, but but maybe I could get another offer somewhere else. As for housing besides yours, this guy and that guy, they might have a small furnished bedroom nearby. I don't know whether he means they might stay in all nearby or whether he's saying they might find a furnished bedroom for him nearby. I don't quite know what he means. But then he says, I like the layout of your dream house and the idea of seeing it makes my mouth water. These are the words he chooses to use. And he's not, um, you know, he's not reading from a script. And so what do you what what comes to mind when you think of those words? What what comes to mind when you, you see words like it makes my mouth water and is thinking about a house? Is his mouth watering? And he's thinking about a, a house. What what kind of comes to mind? I'll tell you what comes to my mind. This. A wolf, right? And um, a wolf. What what, um, what connections do you have to a wolf and its mouth watering? Well, some kind of animal with a with a almost like out of control appetite. Uh, you could even say like a violent predator who, who kind of can't hold his violent fantasies in check or whatever it is, right? Um, someone who is almost at the whim of his appetite, who lets his appetite um, drive his behavior, right? But, but this one, this more than anything else. And so this is who he's going to be inviting into his home. In a very real sense. I mean, he's going to come out of this situation um, injured, uh, yeah, wounded, bleeding, betrayed, hurt damaged, barely alive, ultimately, right? And by his own admission, he's saying the idea of seeing something in my mind makes my mouth water. And so what do you think his mouth's actually watering for? Isn't it brothels and, and um, the people in them? And getting his hands on easy money and maybe pushing around this this um, nobody artist and you know um, it's just a very interesting turn of phrase there his own mouth watering like that right then he says well as much as possible i do not want to think about the promised fruit there again you kind of have a strange reference strange symbolic reference to a place that you might be staying at. He calls it the promised fruit. It's almost like he's talking in the language of forbidden fruit of, you know, it's almost like a, a sexual or I don't know, some kind of, he's kind of got a decadent um, turn of phrase. Do you, do you agree? Then he says, let's wait for better days unless I rid myself of this foul existence that weighs down upon me so horribly outside of work, right? 
And if you think about it, isn't he contradicting himself because Yeri says he's not working. He says he's in a sickly state. Um, he says he's inactive. He says um, I'm dormant, right? He talks about I'll do a portrait, but not yet. And that's that's kind of with regard to work, right? That's how I see it. And then at the end of it all, he says um, that he has a foul existence weighing down upon him outside of work. So in other words, by implication, he's saying, my work is going well, I can work, but everything else is not good, which is a very manipulative thing to say. It's like, if I come to you, then the one thing I can guarantee is I'll be able to work. And all I need to do is just not be where I am and then everything will be sorted out. Sounds really simple, right? Again, do you really want to invite someone who's having this, who's so so um, unhappy in his current circumstances that he calls it a foul existence? Do you really want to invite a foul existence into your home? Because that's exactly what he does. Robbie Robin says, so he still hasn't made a commitment. Well, he kind of has, he does say here, but he kind of drops a hint. He says, when you invited me to come there with your schemes, so it's like you are scheming, a nice Darbo going on there. I formally wrote you one last affirmative letter, happy with your brother's offer. In other words, he's saying, I accept your brother's offer. But he seems to be saying, is it too late? Tell me right away. He says, what does he say? Um, if you were in a different frame of mind, again, he's talking about your frame of mind, and you told me too late, I'd prefer that you do it right away. But he's been stonewalling for months. He's saying, can you give me an answer like right now? Is the office still standing or is Bernard going to take my place? Can you tell me right now? Meanwhile, he's been delaying, postponing, taking his time. He's, he's a total hypocrite. What does he say here? It's taken me a long time to answer you. What do you expect? It's taken me a long time to answer you. What do you expect? And then here he says, I prefer that you do it right away. I prefer that you tell me right now. <laughs> so, you know, he's, he's quite a demanding dude, right? Okay, so I think we're going to end off at this point. And so this is um, going to be Vincent's response two days later to that letter from Gauguin. And we'll see what he says about that, right? And ultimately, Gauguin is going to go to all um, by the following month, by October, I think it's late October, he will be in all. It's going to be quite an interminable thing. It's not going to, it's going to be like a month's worth of, I guess, negotiation, right? Okay, so I think I'm going to end there. My voice is definitely uh, kind of getting a little bit raw. Um, this is a good place to stop, I agree. Uh, I want to thank you guys for the super chats. Uh, I really do appreciate it if you do leave a super chat. Um, I spend quite a lot of time on these Van Gogh letters. Um, I do have a, um, a monthly target um, and uh, certainly on Team Peachtree, I'm, I've been falling short of it. Um, so, yeah, if you're watching this on the replay, consider making, even if it's a small contribution. Um, I do, I have been wanting to put up um, the Avenue of the Giants. 
you know, I've collected a huge amount of photography and footage from my trip to, to America. And I thought I'd have more than enough time to, you know, um, slowly put it all together. But then a story like the, um, the Titan submersible comes along and it's basically, you know, if, if that story wasn't there, there, there wouldn't be that much to cover in true crime right now. I mean, there are things going on. Um, there's the Curry Richens case. Um, next week's going to be quite busy, but if that wasn't there, I probably would have done a lot more on Team Peachtree. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I'm hoping to, at some point, put all of that stuff together. Um, footage of those trees, uh, footage of Yellowstone and Montana, uh, footage of the um, Antelope Canyon, um, footage of Manhattan, um, footage of the New York Public Library. There's so, there's so much stuff that I'm just wanting to, you know, put together. Footage of the Grand Tetons, right? Um, so I haven't forgotten about that. I just um, am prioritizing at the moment the uh, submersible story. Um, yeah, unfortunately, this channel has grown more slowly than I would have hoped. Um, but that's 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 life. <laughs> Uh, Bridget, thank you so much. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Uh, is Indiana Timmy sleeping? Let me call Timmy over. Timmy, <whistles> come boy. Uh, I'm not planning to put together a book of photos. Um, uh, color photo books tend to be expensive. And yeah, it's quite funny. The Titanic folks did that. They put together a color book, and I wonder whether they made any money out of it. Um, yeah, many thanks to the mods and pizzas. Is Iceland still here? To me, come. <whistles> well, my nose is running a little. I'm going to try and get some dinner and then have a nice warm bath. It's, it's almost quarter to two in the morning. Timmy, come. Come, boy. Hey. Timmy's like Gauguin. He's just lazy, lies around, and he he just expects to be walked. Then he kind of comes alive. Uh, an e-book version only. Um, I'm just kind of not in a book frame of mind. I sort of feel like I spend so much time as it is behind the keyboard. I don't want to write any more books for the time being, you know. Meanwhile, here is Timmy. Timmy, come up. Timmy, it's your it's your your moment. Come, come boy. Come. Come boy. Come. Let's see if he will jump up. No, he's right here. He's at my knee. He wants to be picked up. Come boy. Come. Hop. Hop, 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 hop. Come. Come. Hop. Come. Jump up. Come, come boy. Up. Come. There you go. So can you see Timmy's wearing his Indiana outfit? <laughs> Indiana Indiana Homes, not Indiana Jones, Indiana Homes. I actually gave him a bath about two two or three nights ago. Yeah. When Timmy yawns, if I'm scratching his, his, his belly, when Timmy yawns, it's a sign that he's very happy and very soothed. Can you guys see him? He's very happy and very soothed. Lisa B. Hi, good to see you. Yeah, he is adorable, right? Oh, there you go, boy. 
I wonder whether Timmy's ever going to see America. I mean, he's got a nice cowboy jacket on, um, you know. <laughs> hey, you're going to see America. Did you hear that? He went, <clears throat> going to see America. <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks a lot to, to you all for being here. Um, Jalsi says he looks extremely tired. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, yeah, well, I think I did wake him up from his his sleep. But um, Timmy says bye. And I'm going to say bye as well. See you guys again probably around about Wednesday. Um, if the Delphi discovery comes out Wednesday, then I won't see you Wednesday. Um, but um, all things, if all things being equal, I'll see you guys maybe Wednesday or Thursday. So look out for that. Now he's got the gear, right? But it is pretty cold here, so uh, that's one way to keep him warm. Okay, guys, uh, thanks a lot for being here. And as you can see with the Van Gogh letters, it's starting to get really interesting. Um, October's going to be a very important month to see how Van Gogh's mental state starts to become strained. And then from then on, what happens? It's not from then on, it's not only his mental state, it's also physically, what does he start doing? Um, how does he feel insecure, undermined, criticized, um, badly treated, um, invigorated, gaslighted, whatever? We're going to find all of that out um, over the next while. Um, October, though, is still the run up to Gauguin's visit. Gauguin will be in the house, in the yellow house from November onwards, end of October, November, and then part of December. It's a really short time that he's there, but it's like a milestone in art history. It's one of those sort of seminal moments. We're building up to that. Thanks. Thank you for being here. We'll have some catching up to do. Are there notifications on Patreon? Um, notifications about what? Um, I mean, I do all, all the like, current news I do cover on Patreon. Okay. Take care, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Uh, sleep well. See you guys next time. Stay safe. Ciao.